Ephesians 5, the part of the chapter that I wanted to focus on is the latter part there from verses 22 through 33 where God is giving instructions unto husbands and wives. And there are several passages like this in the New Testament. This is probably the most famous one. And it starts out by saying in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And then in verse 33, he gives a synopsis again of what he's saying in this passage, just the main thought. He says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So according to this passage, we can clearly see that the key responsibility of a husband toward his wife is to love his wife. And the key responsibility of the wife toward her husband is to reverence her husband. If we had to pick what is the main thing, that's the main thing. Now, there are many other things that we as husbands need to do besides just loving our wives. There are many other things that our wives need to do besides just reverencing us. But when we want to talk about what is the major theme, it's wrapped up right there in verse 33 when it says, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. What does reverence mean? It, it's, it's, a word, it's like respect, but it's a stronger word for respect. It's more like fear. It's a, it's a very deep respect. But what I want to preach about tonight, and if you would flip over to Proverbs 31, what I want to preach about tonight is just some practical advice for your marriage. I'm going to give some practical things that wives should do, that husbands should do, and, and that both of us in our marriages should be doing in order to have a good marriage. You see, I strongly believe that what works for one person often will work for everybody if it's just straight out of the Bible. You know, a lot of people think that it's got to be different for everybody. Now, I understand that, okay, people are different and they have different situations, but there are certain things in the Bible where God just lays them out as just a principle that's just a universal principle where it just goes for everybody. You know, like you can't sit there and say, well, I just don't think that this arrangement will work in my marriage, you know, where the husband's in charge. I think in my marriage it'd be better if the wife's in charge. Well, you know, that just doesn't work that way. And everybody thinks they're the exception and they're different. But honestly, there are a lot of principles that are just universal in the Bible that we could all put into practice and that we could all use. Now, I'm not one who does a lot of marriage counseling. And uh, a lot of pastors do a lot of marriage counseling. I mean, they're doing marriage counseling just every day, every week. I even know of pastors who put ads in the yellow pages in the marriage counseling section, you know, just to, to, just to do more marriage counseling. I don't know why they, you know, hate themselves that much. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of pastors do a lot of counseling. Now, here's the thing. If somebody asks me for advice on their marriage or has a question about marriage, you know, I'll always answer their question. I don't just say, you know, hey, I don't do counseling. I'll, I'll give them their question, but I don't really do counseling in the traditional sense because of the fact that usually it's not really that hard to figure out what people need to change in their marriage in order to fix it. Usually I have to listen to somebody for about 60 seconds and then I can usually be able to dish out some biblical advice some biblical advice that'll work for everybody. But what I find is that the people who've often come to me and asked me for advice about marriage, I give them advice and it's not what they wanted to hear. And so therefore, the, the, you know, the, the counseling session is cut short because I tell them, you know, do X, Y, and Z and do those things and then come back and talk to me if you still have a problem. And the reality is they say, well, you know, I can't do that and that's not going to work and I, you know, that sounds hard and everything like that. 
And I always tell people, whenever I give people advice on things, like when people come to me with marriage problems, I always tell them this. I say, you know what? I say, here's the things that the Bible says you're supposed to be doing. Do you agree that this is what the Bible says? Oh, yeah. And I say to that person, if you don't do these things, don't come back and talk to me about it. Now, I'm not one that says, hey, if I give you advice, you have to take it. Because you know what? If somebody comes to me and gets advice and they don't think that my advice is right and they don't think my advice is biblical, then they don't have to take my advice. You know, I'm not, I'm not God. I'm not your master. You know, if you just come to me for advice, I'll give you advice. You can take it or leave it. But here's the thing. If somebody comes to me for advice and I give them biblical advice and they don't want to follow it, I don't want that person to come back to me and say, hey, I'm still having the same problem. What now? Uh, the same thing I told you last time. And in reality, our problems can often be solved with just some very simple biblical solutions. But people often don't want to take the steps necessary to fix the problem. They don't often want to hear what the Bible says. Often what they want when they want counseling is they want to tell you a lot of stories and they want to give you all their dirty laundry and just get a lot of things off their chest. And frankly, I don't want to know about all the intricacies and all the negativity within your marriage. Because let me say it this way, I don't think it's necessary for me to know what you've been doing wrong in order to tell you how to do it right. I mean, think about it. Let's say we were talking about cooking. Let's say I were going to teach you how to cook, which would be very ironic indeed. <laughs> But I do know how to make one thing well, and that is a, a cheesy omelet, all right? And I make one virtually every day of my life. But let's say, I'm going to teach you how to make an omelet. I would say to you, come into the kitchen with me and let me show you how to make an omelet. I wouldn't say like, okay, sit down and tell me all the problems you've been having with omelet making. <laughs> tell me about all the failed omelets in your life. Can you show me exactly how you're cracking the egg when shells end up in it? Can you show me exactly why the yolk is constantly, you know, breaking at the wrong time when you're, when you're making eggs or whatever? You know, I don't need you to tell me everything that's wrong in order for me to tell you how to do it right. Now, there, there are a lot of wrong ways to make an omelet. I don't need to know them all in order to teach you the right way to make an omelet. And so people somehow think that I have to know or that a pastor or counselor has to know everything that's wrong with their marriage and tell them all the mistakes and all the problems. And then I'm going to sit here and, and listen to all this crazy stuff. And then now I'm going to tell you how to do it right. I just would rather skip a step and just tell you how to do it right. And in fact, instead of having to just tell you how to do it right personally to your face, which could be a little bit embarrassing for you, if you come to me and have to tell me, hey, you know, I'm having problems or whatever, it, it, it's even better if I can just tell it to the whole church. And so these things that I'm going to give to you tonight are just practical marital advice that just works for everybody. Just practical marital advice that just, it's for all of you. It's for everyone. So instead of having to just on an individual basis go through all your dirty laundry and explain, you know, what the Bible says, you know, it's just, it's just better just to do it as a group. Just that's what the church is supposed to be, just to teach you the word of God. Now, listen, if you do have a serious question and you do have a serious problem, don't refrain from coming to me. But I just de don't need to know details and I don't need to go into a big, long thing with you because honestly, It doesn't take long to figure out what the problem is usually when you talk to people. You know, people are uh, not going to church. They're not reading their Bibles. They're not even married. You know, they're like, oh, I'm having trouble getting along with my wife. Well, actually, she's my live-in girlfriend. It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, I'm not going to be able to fix that for you. You need to get married. You know, you need to at least have some semblance of following the Bible or, or I'm wasting my time even, even speaking to you. But let me give you some practical advice today. Just, I'm going to give some advice for husbands, some advice for wives, and, and I just hope that you can use something in the sermon. I'm just going to give you a lot of tips and things that I've learned and things that I've seen in the Bible. And honestly, uh, you know, I, I believe that these are just universal principles. And you know, that's, that's why I don't do a lot of marital counseling, just because I don't want to really get involved in other people's strife. And I don't want to hear all the detail. Because honestly, I, I want to be able to think the best of you. And I don't want to just know all your darkest secrets or something. You know, this isn't a Catholic church where you go to the confessional booth and just tell all to the pastor. 
Now again, if you have a problem and you need my help, I don't want you to be afraid to come talk to me. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to come down on you. But at the same time, you know, it's better if you can just learn these principles in a setting like this from the pulpit, right? And be able to use these things in your marriage. So first of all, I want to talk about the, for the husbands, you know, some advice for the husbands. Look at Proverbs 31. The Bible says in verse 28, it says, Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. And the first thing I want to say about how to love your wife, because that's the main thing that the husband is supposed to do, to love your wife. First of all, you should love your wife more than you love anyone else. And you should look to your wife as being the greatest woman in the world. And you don't have anyone else that you love more or that is more important to you than she is. That's why he says there, uh, many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. You know, if you read the book of Song of Solomon, a great book on marriage, you'll see the husband is constantly praising his wife's beauty. She is the fairest. She's the most beautiful. She's the most gorgeous. She's wonderful. And that's how we ought to feel about our husband or wife as married people. We should love our wife more than we love anyone else. Okay. And number two, we should praise our wife's beauty, not the beauty of other women. Don't say to your wife, oh, isn't she so beautiful? Isn't this other woman so beautiful? And by the way, don't put up some calendar or some picture or poster of some woman other than your wife. That's not loving your wife. If you're going to put up some other example of some beautiful babe that you have up, well, that's just in the garage. That's just where I work on my car. You know, that's just a guy thing. No, it's a sinful thing. And, you know, if you love your wife, and you really want to make her feel special and make her feel like she's the only woman in your life and that you care for her above all others, you wouldn't put up those, those type of pictures. And number three, never look at pornography. And this is a big one in the day that we live. And it's one that I don't often talk about just because I don't like to talk about unwholesome subjects, but it needs to be dealt with somewhat. Today, men are looking at pornography Uh, on, on a scale that's unbelievable. It's, it's pretty much the number one thing that the internet is used for. If you look at the statistics on it, there's more traffic today going to pornographic websites than any other type of website on the internet. I mean, it's the main uh, function of the internet. Now go to Proverbs chapter 6. Let me show you some scriptures on this. Proverbs chapter 6. While you're turning there, I'll, I'll read for you from Matthew 5:28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. This is a serious sin when you're looking on a woman to lust after her. And that's what you're doing when you pull up pornographic images of women other than your wife. It, it says when you look upon a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery with her already in your heart. This is a major sin. And people try to justify this and say, well, you know, uh, I heard this stupid saying, just because I've already ordered doesn't mean I can't still look at the menu. Well, every restaurant I've ever been to in my life, as soon as I order, they say, give me that menu. And they take the menu away from you. Okay, so that's a dumb illustration. But either way, that might sound cute to you. But you know what? We as, as husbands need to have respect for our wife's feelings and understand that she's not going to be feel loved if we're sharing our affections with, with someone else. And when we're lusting after some other woman's beauty in our heart and committing adultery in our heart. It's a spiritual, mental type of unfaithfulness, you know, when you're going to lust in your heart after another woman. Look at Proverbs 6, verse 32. It says, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Now this scripture is talking about a man becoming jealous because his wife has committed adultery. But let me say this, the flip side is also true. A wife is going to be jealous of a husband who goes out and commits adultery also. And that jealousy will produce rage and anger. And we see that in the life of King David where King David and his wife Michal became estranged from one another because she was jealous of other women in David's life. Because David did not keep his affections only upon her, but shared his affections with others and had multiple wives. And every story in the Bible where multiple wives are involved, there's jealousy involved, there's rage involved, there's enmity involved, because this jealousy thing goes two ways. And it's not the person who's jealous that's the problem. It's the person who's being unfaithful that's the problem. Amen. 
Oh, the jealous husband. Yes, I'm a jealous husband because my wife is mine alone. And every wife should be jealous of their husband. And every husband should be jealous of their wife because we don't believe in sharing our spouses. And so don't get angry at someone for being jealous. Get angry at the one who is sharing their affection with someone outside of marriage and not keeping themselves holy under their spouse. That's who we ought to get upset about. But let me tell you, I'm constantly hearing from people that are addicted to pornography, that are struggling with the sin of looking at pornography. And uh, I'll read for you from Romans 13, 14. You don't have to turn there. But it says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. He said, don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Let me say this. If you are one who is struggling with internet pornography, the, the, the salute, we don't need a marriage counseling session to deal with this. You don't need to come to my office necessarily and go over this with me because I'm going to give you the advice preemptively right now. You need to get rid of your internet connection. Okay, now look, I'm not saying that everyone needs to get rid of their internet connection, but if this is something that you're tempted by and that you're struggling with, then you need to just get rid of your internet connection. It's that simple. Because think about it. For example, you know, I don't drink alcohol. I've never drunk alcohol in my life. I've never drunk a beer or I've never been drunk. I don't really know what that's like. I grew up in a Christian home and that's one thing I never uh, experimented with. But let me say this. If you were to put a bottle of booze in my kitchen cabinet, that bottle of booze would be there untouched for the next hundred years. I'm not going to touch that thing because it's just not a temptation for me. It's something that I've never done. It's something that I've never been into. I have no desire to start drinking. I've never drunk in the past. I'm not going to drink in the future. That bottle of booze would just sit in that cupboard and it would collect dust and it really wouldn't bother me at all. But let me tell you something, someone who's been an alcoholic, someone who's struggled with that, and you put that bottle of booze in their kitchen cabinet, that's a big temptation for them. That's something that's going to cause them to fall. Now, again, I wouldn't store alcohol in my house just because I'm against alcohol. But I'm just trying to illustrate to you that certain people have certain proclivities toward certain sins because once you open that door of a particular sin, that temptation is always going to be there. Think about it. If you've never taken heroin... You're not going to sit around just, man, I wish I had some heroin right now. <laughs> you know, you, never, you, don't, you can't crave something that you've never had. And by the way, that's why it's better just to never even start smoking. Yeah, and you're never going to crave cigarettes. You never even started. You know, you never start drinking. And then you're not going to crave that feeling of being drunk. You don't even know what it is. <laughs> what I'm saying is that if you're one who struggles in that area or one who has in the past struggled in that area and that's a temptation for you and you say, man, I just keep going back and looking at it. Get rid of the temptation. The Bible says, lead us not into temptation. You shouldn't even just have it right there. I mean, think about it. And if you are one who has this tendency to look at pornography and you're carrying a smartphone You're basically, you're just carrying around with you in your pocket the ability to look at pornography at any time in your pocket. And then you say, well, I just don't know why I can't kick this habit. I mean, that'd be like if you were saying, you know, I really want to kick the habit of, of gluttony and overeating. And you just live in a house that's just filled with Twinkies and Ho-Hos. I mean, all over the counters, you have Twinkies, you have Ho-Hos, you've got soda in the fridge, you've got all kinds of sweets and treats, and you're just saying, I just don't understand, I just keep giving in to temptation. Obviously, the smart thing to do would be to get it out of your house, you know, and just have nutritious foods in your house as an alternative. And I, so I'm telling you, that if you are one who is, is struggling with internet pornography, you need to just get rid of your internet connection because honestly, you can live without the internet. Now, the internet does have many legitimate uses, but wait a minute, we could all live without it. People, I mean, people didn't even have, when I was a kid, and I'm a young man, people didn't even have computers when I was a kid. Almost no one had a computer, let alone the internet. And you know what, I thank God, listen to me, I thank God that when I was a kid, this stuff wasn't available. Because honestly, if this stuff would have been available when I was a teenager, I can see that I myself could have fallen into this. You know, when you're young, when you're immature, when you're carnal, when you're sinful, when you're immature, I could see myself having gotten on the internet and looked at stuff that I shouldn't have looked at. Thank God it wasn't available back then. 
You know, and by the time it became available, by the time the internet came out and, and, and was high speed and you could actually look at images or videos or anything like that, you know, I was already mature enough in the Lord to not seek after those things. But you know what? Little kids and teenagers, they're not going to have that discernment. They're not going to have that maturity. They're not going to have that wisdom. And so don't give them unfettered access to the internet. Because it's just the door is wide open for them to, to just out of curiosity or just out of their wickedness to, to, to go into things that they shouldn't go into. Now, the best illustration I could think of about this is my microwave. Okay. <clears throat> you know, the microwave is really convenient. But, you know, we came to a point where we decided, you know, we don't want to eat stuff out of the microwave. It's probably not the healthiest way to make your food. And... And uh, we decided, let's, let's use the microwave less. Let's, in fact, let's just, and then we said, let's just stop using the microwave. But we just kept using it every day because it's just so convenient. And my wife and I decided we're not going to use the, 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 the microwave anymore. But we just kept using the microwave. Why? Because it's just so convenient. It's just so easy to just, oh, just this once, you know, just heat something up real quick. Yeah, I'll just heat that up. I'll just heat everything up. You know, you're heating stuff up every single day. And so finally I realized the only way to stop using the microwave is to get rid of the microwave. Because if it's there, you're going to use it. And so I ripped out my microwave and, and threw it in the garbage can and, and um, you know, put in like a hood fan instead. And guess what? I've never used the microwave since. And I don't find myself just, you know, sneaking food down to the gas station and using the gas station's <laughs> microwave. You know, because it's just the fact that it's just right there. It's just so easy. It's just so convenient to just fall back into that. Now, I'm not saying that using the microwave is a sin, okay? I'm just saying that I didn't want to use the microwave. I was trying to eat healthier and use the oven and the stove to cook things instead of the microwave. But when you have a problem with alcohol, alcohol needs to be gone from your house. And if you have a problem with smoking, you need to get all cigarettes away from you. And if you have a problem with drugs, you need to have all drugs taken away from you. And you need to get rid of the internet access if it's leading you into sin. You know, whatever it is that's leading you into sin, whether it's your microwave or whether it's your internet, I'm just kidding. But my point being, don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That's an easy fix, folks. And you know, you can downgrade this thing to just being a phone if you can't handle that internet connection. Now, if you're using it for a legitimate purpose and you're not using it to get into sin, well, you know what? That's up to you because you're an adult to be able to parent yourself and take care of yourself. But don't just give a kid unfettered access to this because they're not going to refrain from looking at the wrong things. They don't have the maturity or the wisdom or the discernment in most cases. Number four. These are just tips for husbands. I got to hurry because I got to get to the wives. Number four, uh, as a husband, you need to make all the money and pay all the bills. Why? Because the one who pays the bills is the one who makes the rules. Okay? And the Bible says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Okay? Number five, you need to be manly. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, in a long list of sins, it says, The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. The modern Bible versions change this and take this out. But according to the King James Bible, being effeminate is a sin. Amen. What does it mean to be effeminate? It's a man that acts womanly in his behavior. You say, why is that bad for my marriage? Because your wife, her primary responsibility to you is what? To reverence you. Yep. It's going to be hard for her to reverence you when you're a little twinkie and a little sissy. <laughs> and when you're being a girly man, she's, she's going to have a hard time respecting you. What are we supposed to do for our wives? Love our wives. How do we love our wives? That means we love her more than anyone else. We don't share our affections amongst other women. We're not looking at pornography. We're not uh, you know, praising other women's beauty and putting up other posters and things like that. And then what's her responsibility toward us? To reverence us. Well, you know what? If you want reverence and you want respect, strive to be respectable. If you want to be respected, you need to be respectable. Here's one thing that will bring you respect when you pay the bills, when you make the money, as the Bible teaches, that the man should provide. Uh, when you're manly and someone that your wife can look to as, as someone that's manly, not a, a queer little sissy. Um, 
Number six, and for this I'll read 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Number six, you need to be mature and not be juvenile and do things like playing video games all the time. You know, you want your wife to reverence you. It's hard to reverence a video game addict. I mean, the word reverence and video game addict just don't go together. I want my wife to fear me and reverence me and respect me. And, you know, you, you spend hours and hours playing video games or being juvenile in other ways. You say, what are some other examples of being juvenile? Just trying to be just so trendy all the time. You know, just acting like a child, thinking that you're like a teenager or something. Grow up, be manly, be an adult, be mature. And then it'll be easier for your wife to respect you when you're respectable. Okay, uh, being juvenile. You know, you see people today that they get, they get so into uh, professional sports sometimes and they get juvenile about it sometimes. You know, they're like a little kid or something, you know. And look, if you like sports, I'm not against you liking sports. But you know what? You need to keep that in, you need to keep that mature and adult and in moderation. And not, you know, not just become one that's just like a little kid or something. Just, you know, in front of the TV for hours and with your, all your, you know, junk food and you're sedentary and you're out of shape. And, and you're just, you know, just so into the game and like a little kid. I mean, little kids love to idolize sports stars. You know, men grow up and they, they do their own exploits. You know, they, they live their own lives and they don't get that excited about a game. It's a game. <laughs> it's not life. It's not, yeah, it's a, you know, we, yeah, we beat them, yeah. You didn't do anything. You're not on that team. We won. You're not on the team. <laughs> you couldn't even run from one of that football field to the other without, <laughs> without, you know, being out of breath, let alone play the game, all right? But I'm just saying, you know, you got to be mature, folks. No woman wants to be married to a video game addict. No woman wants to be married to someone who acts like a child and is juvenile and is into video games and just idolizes sports heroes and, and, and in an immature way. Okay, so number seven, go to Proverbs 31 once again. Proverbs 31, I don't know if you're still there. But in Proverbs 31, I, I want to show you that... Uh, Some things that you can do to help your marriage as a husband is to express appreciation unto your wife. Express your feelings toward your wife of, of love and affection. Tell her that you love, you love her, but also express your appreciation for her and what she does. See, the Bible says in Proverbs 31, 28, her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. You see that? Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Watch this. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. So she should be recognized and praised and rewarded for the good things that she does and shown appreciation by her husband. And eighthly, let me say this to husbands, never complain about your wife to someone outside of your marriage. And this is something that husbands and wives are both often guilty of. You'll, you'll hear it all the time. A husband criticizing his wife to other people. It's a shame. Wives criticizing their husband to other people. It's hurting your marriage. These are some things that you can do, husbands, to help your marriage. Love your wife. Love her more than anyone else. Express that love to her. Don't put up pictures and things of other women. Don't get into pornography. Uh, also, you need to make the money and pay the bills. You need to be manly. You need to be mature. Don't be juvenile. You need to express your appreciation to your wife. And don't complain about your wife to someone outside of the marriage. Now, on to the wives. Let me just flip that coin, of course, that the wife should not complain about her husband to other people. Number one, don't criticize your husband to other people. And I, I've heard it in this church. I've heard it everywhere I go. You hear people just criticizing their, their spouse to other people. And, you know, when that, get, when that gets back to them, that's going to hurt your marriage. And, and you know what it does? It's breaking the closeness and the trust of your marriage. Because here you're supposed to be on the same team. And you, what you're doing when you criticize your spouse to other people, you're siding with other people against your spouse is what you're doing. You know, you're putting distance between you and your spouse and you're siding with someone else to gang up and criticize your spouse. That's why you should never hang around with people that are critical of your spouse 
or critical of their own spouse or of just all men in general. You know, there are women out there, they're just these man-hating type women. They've been divorced three times, and let me tell you something, all men are this, and all men, you know, and they're just these man-haters. Or even just women who just despise their own husband. Because the Bible says, evil communication corrupts good manners. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. And when you walk with people that are like that, you're going to learn their ways. When they are constantly criticizing their husband or just negative about men in general. And there are women that are like that. And not only that, especially if they're not critical of your husband. Because, you know, they might have something against your husband in particular. Maybe your family. You have family members who are just constantly ragging on your husband to you. You need to just stop hanging around with those people for a while. And tell them, hey, we can have a relationship again when you stop criticizing my husband to me. And stand up for your husband. St you know, stand up for your wife. But, you know, this is part is under the women. Stand up for your husband and side with him against other people. Don't side with his enemies against him. It's going to destroy your marriage. Here are some other things under that same type of a point. Don't ever tell a story about your husband that embarrasses your husband. That's another way, irreverent thing that you could do to your husband. Telling a story about your husband where it's embarrassing unto him or reflects poorly on him. That, you know, what are you, what are you accomplishing with that? All you're doing is just enraging your husband. All you're doing is just tearing him down in your own sight and in the sight of others. Uh, also, don't disclose your finances to other people as a woman. Don't go around talking about your financial problems as a wife because you know what that does? That reflects poorly on your husband and then that's going to make him ashamed and that's going to make him angry and that's embarrassing unto him. Yeah. You know, don't go around just talking about your financial problems all the time because it reflects poorly on your husband. Are you listening? Uh, you know, critic, being critical of your husband. You need to love him and stand up for him and 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 not do that. You know, another thing that you should not do if you want to have a good marriage, don't compliment other men to your husband. Don't go to your husband and start telling him how great other men are. Isn't he so handsome? Isn't he, doesn't he make so much money? Isn't, you know, isn't he such a great guy? Look at how he treats. What a wonderful guy. Isn't he so cool? You know, that's just a subtle way of just not being supportive of your husband. You know, you should praise your husband and compliment him, not compliment other men to him. And again, you know, this is, you know, we talk about men with their, you know, with their posters and their whatever they get into on the internet. But you know what? It, it, it's a, it's a two-way street with that too. When women are idolizing these stupid faggoty actors, yeah. right? And saying like, oh, you know, oh, uh, who, Brad Pitt, oh, you know, uh, Johnny Depp, oh, oh, you know, Tom Cruise, oh, you know, Justin Bieber, oh, you know. <laughs> I just had to throw that in, you know. But, but let me, you know, oh, Keanu Reeves, oh, Leonardo DiCaprio, oh, you know, shut up. These guys are a bunch of sodomite faggots. Yeah. They're not, you know, and you're, you're idolizing him for being so manly. He's an actor. He's acting manly because he's an actor. In real life, he's a queer. He's a sodomite. He doesn't even like women. Yeah. Seriously, Hollywood, listen. I've got a good friend who works in Hollywood. He said it's all sodomites. Yeah. Yeah. Did you need him to tell you that? But it's true, though. I mean, it's, all so it's, it's filled with sodomites. That's who dominates Hollywood. That's who runs it. That's who the actors are. It's a bunch of, of filth. And so it's just as wicked when women try to jump on this bandwagon and start lifting up and exalting their male heart throbs and so forth. You know, that's hurtful to your husband because jealousy is the rage of a man, the Bible says. You want to enrage your husband? Start telling him about Johnny Depp with his faggoty eyeliner. Every time I see a picture of that guy, he's got eyeliner on. What's his deal? Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's a pirate. Yeah, I'm sure pirates went around putting on makeup. I mean, what kind of stupidity? This is the stupidity of Hollywood. I'm sure, I'm sure pirates just, they really, you know, had their Revlon and their Maybelline and their Max Factor on that pirate ship. And they applied makeup. No, he's applying makeup because that's the queerness and weirdness of Hollywood for you. And so don't sit there and insult your husband and demean your husband by praising other men to him. Praise him to him. Tell him how great he is. 
Tell him what a cool guy he is. Tell him what a stud he is. Don't sit there and praise uh, other men, whoever they are, to your husband and, and not praise him to him. That's insulting, especially when you're praising the queers of Hollywood. Okay, what else? Number two, that's number one. Don't, don't be critical of your husband, especially to other people. Number two, treat your husband respectfully. You know, obviously the Bible said, see that the wife reverence her husband. What are some ways you could do that? Well, first of all, you should not scold or rebuke your husband. Now go to uh, 1 Timothy 5.1. See, a lot of ladies, they mistakenly get the idea that it's their job to correct and rebuke and straighten out their husband all the time. Well, he's not doing what he's supposed to do, and he's not obeying the Lord, and he's not, you know. But here's the thing. God did not give that women that responsibility to make sure that their husband lives right. Now, he did give husbands the responsibility to make sure that their wife lives right. Well, that's a double standard. Yes, it is. You're finally getting it. But let, listen, it's not the wife's job to be the parent or an authority figure over the husband and scold him and rebuke him and correct him and make sure that he does what he's supposed to do because it's not your responsibility. Now, the Bible does teach that it is the man's responsibility, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and to, and to, to, to wash and cleanse his wife spiritually and, and help her to grow and, and to be able to present her and so forth. But let me say this, it's not the wife's responsibility to make sure that, his, that her husband lives for the Lord. It's only a one-way street there. It's the husband's responsibility to make sure the wife is, is doing what she's supposed to be doing, but it's not the wife's responsibility to make sure that the husband's doing right. And, and, and here's the thing, this will destroy your marriage when you have this dynamic of a wife that's trying to rule over her husband, lord over him, scolding him, correcting him, rebuking him, and, and you're not allowing him to be the leader, as the Bible teaches he should be. You know, a scripture I would point to is 1 Timothy 5.1, where it says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. Now, I realize this isn't about husbands. This is about the pastor. When it says, Rebuke not an elder, it's talking about an elder, meaning like a bishop or a pastor. But here's the thing. If you're not supposed to rebuke the pastor, but entreat him as a father, what that means is that if the pastor uh, says something that you think is wrong or does something that you think is wrong, you're to go to him and kindly entreat him and explain to him the, his error of his ways. Okay. It's not saying, hey, you can never tell the pastor he's wrong. You can tell the pastor he's wrong, but you entreat him as a father. You come to him respectfully and, and let him know. Uh, you don't rebuke him. What's rebuke? Rebuke is, is a scolding. It's all about the respect that you show. What's the difference between entreaty, entreaty and rebuke? The level of respect. But here's the thing. The reason we can apply this same principle unto husbands and wives is because we know that the wife is told to reverence her husband. And so, in fact, the wife should show even more respect to, the, to her own husband than unto the pastor. You know, it's even a greater respect that's shown. I don't even call myself reverend. Hey, reverend. I don't even go by that name. Okay? Because, I, you know, I think that that word's overkill for a pastor. I mean, that's my opinion. I think reverend is a little over the top for a pastor, but it's not over the top for a husband. And it's not over the top for the Lord. You know, those are people that deserve those titles. And let me say this, you know, uh, you should not rebuke or scold your husband. If you, you know, bring in something to his attention kindly, okay. But you don't, just don't feel the need that it's your responsibility to fix every problem in his life. You know, he, he's a grown man. If you don't like the way he is, why did you marry him? Well, I married him with the hopes I'd fix him later. That was a bad idea. You know, because honestly, it's not your job as a wife to, to fix him. Um, you know, you need to show him the respect of not scolding and, and rebuking him and coming down on him. And, and, you know, just to give you some examples, you know, I, I, I've seen wives just completely freak out. And, and you know, they're going to, they're going to, threaten to leave their husband, they're going to call the police, they're going to do it because their husband smokes pot. Now listen, smoking pot's a wicked sin. I'm not going to defend it for one second. I'm against it. It's wrong. It's sin. I put it in the same category with drunkenness. The Bible commands us to be sober. It is sinful. It is wrong. But let me tell you something. It's not the wife's job to just say, hey, you know, if you don't stop drinking, I'm leaving. If you won't stop smoking pot, I'm leaving. You know, if you don't quit doing that, you know what? That is out of line. 
There's not what the Bible ever teaches. You'll never find in the Bible where the Bible says, hey, you know, if your husband's doing wrong, you know, you, you, can, you can fix it. You can, you can threaten to leave. No, the Bible says, let not the wife depart from her husband. That's what it says. It says that the husband and wife are in it for better, for worse, and not to, uh, be, be, to cut asunder what God has joined together. And so this attitude of just, well, but there are just certain things where I draw the line and blah, blah, blah. You know, you just need to get over it. And I know that that preaching might make some people uncomfortable. But I, I, I'm going I'm to say it right now that, you know what, when you get married, it's till death do us part. And it's a relationship where the husband is in authority. That's what biblical marriage is. And, you know, if you marry a guy who's a loser, who sits around playing video games and smoking pot, you know, you got to think about that before you get married. But if you're married to a guy like that, let's say right now you're like, Pastor, that's me right now, Pastor Anderson. I am married to a pot smoking video game addict. Then you know what your job is? To be the best wife that you can be, to love your husband, to reverence your husband, to obey your husband. And to, to serve the Lord and do the best you can in that situation. And I, you know, I'm sorry that your life turned out that way. But honestly, when you get married, that's the commitment that you're making. And so this attitude of scolding and yelling at your husband, screaming at your husband because of whatever the, whatever the sin, you know, it's not going to help your marriage. It's not going to fix anything. It's not biblical. <clears throat> Number three Uh, you want to have a happy marriage, wives? You know, you liked it when I was on the husbands. <laughs> Now you're like, oh, oh, oh. but anyway, you know, uh, don't complain. Don't be a complainer. You know, the Bible says when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Bible talks about clamor, being clamorous, about being a, a complainer. It's a sin. Okay, uh, number four, go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I'm just, I, I know I'm just throwing a lot of points at you. I'm just throwing points at you. But you know what? If people would do this stuff, they would get along with their spouse. You know, it, it, do you want to get along with your spouse? Follow these principles and you'll get along with your spouse. You know, you want, your, you want, you want to get along with your husband and you're having a hard time getting along with your husband? Well, here's the thing. Stop scolding him. Be respectful to him. Stop trying to correct him and straighten him out and fix him all the time and start obeying him. That's what the Bible says. But that's not what people want to hear often, but that's what the Bible says. You know, you want to, uh, uh, to, to get along with your husband, you know, you got to stop criticizing him to other people. You got to stop being critical of him and praising other men unto him. You know, you need to start uh, loving him for who he is. You need to stop complaining. Uh, number four, Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Number four is that, You need to have empathy for your husband, meaning that when he's happy, you should be happy with him. And when he's down, you should mourn with him. Now, that's called empathy. When you reflect the feelings of other people yourself. So when your husband is rejoicing, you should be rejoicing with him. If he's happy, that should make you happy. And if he's sad or down, that should make you down also. And you know what? This can be obviously one that could go both ways too, between husband and wife. You say, why is this important? Because some people have a, a marriage where they're, they're not in tune with each other. And basically, you know, when one person's down, they're happy. The other one gets happy that you're down. And then, and then, other, and then you know, when you're happy, I'm in a bad mood. Why? Because this is what it is. They have this us against them, like variance with their spouse, where basically it's kind of, it's like a, it's like a battle. I mean, look, people are like this with their spouse sometimes where it's like a battle. Instead of being like a friendship or they're on the same team, they're, they're both, you know, doing the same. Uh, because think about this. If we're both on the same team and we're both united, us, us against the world kind of a mentality, then when I'm happy, you're going to be happy too. I mean, if the people we love are happy, that should make us happy, right? And if the people that we love are sad, wouldn't that make us sad too? But you'll see people that have a bad relationship, this isn't how they are. One will get happy when the other's down, or vice versa. Okay, so you, need, you know, how you would apply this is just when you see your spouse happy, rejoice with them. 
share in their joy. And when you see them down, you know, don't just be all jovial and bubbly. The Bible says not to sing songs unto those that are of a heavy heart. It can really irritate people when they're in a bad mood and you're just like really happy and jovial. It's, it's almost like a little salt in the wound. Instead, you should have some empathy and try to uh, mirror your spouse's mood a little bit and, and try to understand where they're coming from and try to feel what they feel. And then I, I just got to quickly hurry through some of these. But uh, if you would go to uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, obviously, you know, uh, things that wives should be doing. I'm going to skip some of this for sake of time, but obviously, you know, cook the food that your husband likes to eat. You want to get along with your husband? Make food that he likes. If it's food that he doesn't like, don't make it. Now, obviously, you need to feed him nutritious food. So I'm not saying to just, you know, just feed him all kinds of junk because he just wants junk. You know, try to slowly ease him into nutritious foods if, if he's one that is prone to junk food. But honestly, make him the food that he likes, and that's going to make him happy. Uh, you know, uh, be feminine. You know, we talked about being manly, being masculine. You know, you need to be feminine. Your husband doesn't want you to be going around the house in your carpenter pants and, you know, your short hair and you're all gruff and you're walking like a cowboy and everything, you know. <laughs> be feminine. Be, you know, be appealing unto your husband by being feminine, by being womanly in your demeanor and in your appearance if you want uh, to get along with your husband. What's the sermon about? It's about getting along. It's about having a good marriage. It's about being happy in your marriage and not having a lot of marital problems. And a lot of these things, people will resist these things that I'm listening. I'm just throwing ideas at you. And a lot of people will resist these things. Well, why should I? Because you want to have a happy marriage, because you want to obey the Bible, because you want to do what's right. Well, you know, why do I have to always, you know, make the food that he wants? And why do I have to, you know, do all this stuff? Because you love your husband and because you want to get along. Now, what are some things that both people should be doing? Well, did I return to Proverbs 1? Proverbs 1.24 says this, Because I've called and ye refused, I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded. So what we get in this verse here is the image of, you know, reaching out to somebody and being rejected. You know, it reminds me of that video. There's a really good video on YouTube where Obama, I think he's in Russia or something, and he, he walks up to these, these foreign ministers and these ambassadors. He holds his hand out to one to and they just don't shake his hand. And then he goes to the next and they don't shake it. And he goes to the next and then finally he's just kind of like, you know, <laughs> but you know, uh, has anybody seen that video? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Go home and watch it. But anyway, uh, you know, if you're one that doesn't have to demolish their internet because of your, you know, pornography addiction. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, honestly, uh, Obama is just getting just completely disrespected by these people. I mean, he just, he holds out his hand. And there's, I mean, it's so embarrassing. Can you think of anything more embarrassing? I mean, you're the president of the United States. You hold out your hand and just... I mean, he's, and you can tell he's just embarrassed. He doesn't know what to do. Now, get that image in your mind and think about this. You don't want to treat your spouse that way. Because in our lives, on a daily basis, and, and, and so this point is, number one, don't rebuff your spouse when they reach out to you. You know, and obviously, you know, I'm not talking about a handshake where, you know, your, your wife goes to shake your hand and you're like, Pfft. I mean, hopefully your relationship's not that bad. But, you know, honestly, throughout our lives, there are often times where we as husbands or wives will, will reach out to the other person in some way, make some gesture. You know what I'm saying? Make some gesture of maybe wanting to have a conversation or, you know, wanting to have fun together, wanting to go somewhere together or just, you know, wanting to do something and, and just reaching out to them, proverbially speaking, and wanting to have a, a close relationship with them. Maybe you just want to give them a hug or just want to talk to them or, or bring up something to talk about. And, and you know, when, you, when, you're, when your wife comes to you and, and, and reaches out to you like that and you just do like a, a, a Russian emissary did to Obama, I mean, that, you know, that's going to hurt your wife's feelings. Or, you know, and you know what's going to happen next time? They're going to be less likely to reach out to you in the future. 
You know, when you call to someone and they refuse, when you stretch out your hand and no man regards it, you know what? You're going to be a little shy about reaching out your hand. And a lot of marriages, the, the husband and wife get very distant from one another and really cold with each other and really estranged from one another because when one person reached out, the other person refused and then the distance just builds and the coldness just builds. And then you're going to be less likely to reach out that hand the next time. And then not only that, but uh, number two, that's number one, but number two, you know, especially when, you're, when your spouse wants to, as the Bible says, lie with you, you know, and when, the, when your spouse wants to go to the bedroom with you and you turn down your spouse, you're doing damage to your marriage. And by the way, that is a sin, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Go to 1 Corinthians 7 quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to briefly touch this point. But see, honestly, the stuff that I'm saying right now, this stuff is not being practiced in most marriages, and that's where the problems are coming from. That's where a lot of the problems are coming from. You know, you want to know why 50, 75% of marriages are ending in divorce? It's because of, of men looking at pornography. It's because they don't love their wife more than any other woman. It's because they don't show her love and affection. It's because they don't, you know, uh, uh, live their life in a respectable, reverence-worthy way. It's because wives are not obeying their husbands. They're not respecting him. They're critical of him. They're down on him. They're scolding him. They're, they're not empathizing with him. You know, uh, and, and you want to know why uh, spouses are having a bad marriage. You know, part of it is because of, of a lack of a, of a bedroom life, of a lack of intimacy in the bedroom uh, between married people. And the Bible talks a lot about this. You know, I'm not going to go into a lot of scriptures on it tonight. But the Bible, of course, says in, in verse 2 of, of 1 Corinthians 7, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except to be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now what the Bible's teaching here is that if your wife wants that relationship with you, and you turn her down, you're committing sin because you're defrauding her. I mean, does fraud sound like something sinful? Yeah. Fraud? That's a pretty strong word. Yeah. He says you're defraud, and, and, the and if the Bible says defraud her not, and you're defrauding her, then it's a sin because you're disobeying the word. And then the other way around, too. If the man, or I'm sorry, if the, if the woman, you know, rebuffs her husband, her husband wants to have that physical relationship with her, and she turns him down, you know what? That is also sin. But not only is it sin, because it's a violation of 1 Corinthians 7, not only is it sin, it's also, it's also stupid. Now, here's why it's stupid. Who here is a man that says, I want my wife to commit adultery? And who here is a woman that would say, I want my husband to commit adultery? Okay, so here's the thing. By denying your spouse that relationship, you're being stupid because you're opening up temptation for your spouse to commit adultery. Now, again, I'm not excusing anyone who commits adultery, and I would never say, well, you know, that adultery was justified because of, you know, uh, the fact that it was being denied at home. But let me tell you something. Stone the adulterer with stones, okay, is my opinion on that. But let me, you know, adultery is a major sin. But listen, if you're just a smart man or just a smart woman, and you realize that your spouse has a need in that area and you're not filling it, you know, what are you opening up the possibility of? It, that need being filled somewhere else and you're being stupid. So number one, it's sin. Number two, it's stupid. And number three, it's, it's hurtful. You know, and again, this is like the whole thing of, you know, your spouse is reaching out to you, trying to have a good relationship with you and you shoot them down then they're going to be less likely to reach out to you the next time. And then it's going to build distance and coldness and anger. You say, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't feel like it. Well, you know, sometimes I don't feel like going to church. And sometimes I don't feel like reading my Bible. And sometimes I don't feel like eating my vegetables. And sometimes I don't feel like praying. And sometimes I don't feel like doing a lot of things like going to work and paying the bills. But you know what? You do things in life because they're right to do. You do the right thing because it's right, not necessarily because you feel like it, okay? Uh, you do what is right. And, you know, sometimes you do things for other people. You know, not necessarily for yourself, but you do things for other people because it's the right thing to do. Uh, number three, go to 1 Peter chapter 3. This, this is a good one. 1 Peter chapter 3 is that we should be courteous 
to one another. What does it mean to be courteous to one another? That means to be polite and, and to talk to each other in kind words. Isn't that what you think of when you hear courteous? Being courteous, you know, using kind words, being polite to each other, talking nicely to each other. Now, you, you might not think of this as a marriage verse, but this actually is a marriage verse if you look at the context. Look at 1 Peter 3.8. It says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. But if you get the context of this, verses 5 through 7 are all about marriage. Do you see that? So verses 5 through 7 are about marriage. In fact, the whole chapter from verses 1 through 7 is all about marriage. And then he wraps it up by saying, finally, be courteous. So you, this is applicable unto marriage. Because verse 5 says, after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Watch this. This goes with being courteous too. Giving honor unto the wife. Do you see that? Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And then we have the verse about being courteous in verse 8. So another thing that you can do to have a better marriage is to treat your spouse with courtesy. Be careful of the words that you use with your spouse. Don't use harsh words, but be polite, be courteous, be gentle with your spouse, and, and do not uh, speak to them in a very impolite, rude, discourteous way. By the way, this isn't in my notes, but... In the scripture, it says that Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You, that will improve your marriage. Call your husband Lord or Sir. Woo! Is that what the Bible says? Oh, man, that's crazy. No, you're crazy. If you think that the way our culture deals with marriage is the right way. If you think that the American culture promotes a good marriage, you're crazy. I think that they, I think the Bible's right. I think you're wrong. I think that it was a good idea when Sarah called Abraham Lord. And I think it's right for wives today to call their husbands Sir. Sir would be like a modern day or Lord. You say, oh, I can't even imagine that. Well, you know what? Uh, welcome to, you know, uh, the world of biblical marriage. I can't even imagine that. Oh, okay. How much TV have you been watching? You know, where are you getting your ideas about what's right and wrong? Not from this book, apparently, because the Bible's pretty clear on this. Uh, another thing on this same subject of, of, of being courteous is, you know, we need to be slow to anger. And part of being slow to anger, because the Bible says, let every man be uh, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, slow to anger. Another part of being slow to anger is not being really touchy. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, you just wear your feelings on your sleeve where everything that is said unto you, and, and again, this stuff goes for both husband and wife. Every little thing your spouse says, like, what's that supposed to mean? What do you mean by that? You know, just your spouse says something that maybe is a little ambiguous, give him, give him the benefit of the doubt or give her the benefit of the doubt. And don't just jump all over your spouse and just be on a hair trigger. I mean, think about it. Just on a hair trigger, just waiting for her to say the wrong thing and I'm just going to explode. You know, just on a hair trigger to blow up, just get angry, just touchy. Every little thing is just, what's that supposed to mean? And another, another thing about this too is people who put a negative filter on everything that their spouse says, like they put a negative slant on it. Like, let me give you an example. And, and the verse I thought of with this is where the Bible says, unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure but even their mind and conscience defiled. You know, sometimes we judge people by our own heart and it's like no matter what they say, we're gonna take it the wrong way because we have a bad attitude. Now let me give you an example of this, of just putting a negative filter on everything. There are people who just, anything you say to them, they interpret it in a negative way. Like for example, let's say I said to my wife, wow, this, this meal is amazing. I mean, this spaghetti is way better than usual. Oh, so what you're saying is that all the other times it tastes like garbage, you know? Or like, wow, honey, you are so gorgeous today. Oh, so normally I'm not? So why just today? So you're saying yesterday I looked awful? And you know, it sounds silly, but some people are like this. 
You know, you just tell, you know, it'd be like if you, if you told your husband, like, wow, you know, you are, you have really been, uh, you know, uh, bringing home some great paychecks lately, honey. It's like, what, what do you mean lately? I've been supporting you, you know? Now, it, and look, in all of those examples, isn't it a positive statement that's being made? Hey, this, this meal is, this is the best, this is the best spaghetti you've ever made. This is the, oh, so in the past there was something wrong with it. You know, or hey, you look great today. Or hey, you're really bringing home the bacon these days. <laughs> But what happens is, you know, there's two ways that you can interpret that. You know, if you, if you love your spouse and you want to get along and have a good marriage, you know what you're going to do? You're going to look at things through a positive filter. You're going to give the benefit of the doubt. You're going to latch on to the positive part of that statement and say, thank you. And not just fixate upon the most negative aspect of that, of that statement. And uh, man, there's so much more in my notes. I have like way too much for one sermon here. But go if you would to, uh, go if you would to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. I got to hurry up and finish. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it's amazing how people... People who love each other, they, they interpret everything that their spouse says and does in a positive light. They put a positive spin on it. And then people that are disgruntled with their spouse, they put a negative spin on everything that their spouse says or does. And so, you know, this is something that you need to work on, just having a positive attitude toward your spouse. Now, one part of this, too, is that, and I'm just trying to blow through some of these last points, is that, you know, you should never hold a grudge from one day to the next in your marriage. The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. That means at the end of the day, everything's over, and the next day, it's a fresh start. Every day has to be a fresh start. But you know, when marriages go downhill, it's, they don't just go downhill in one day. People don't just have a happy marriage, and then they just wake up one day, have horrible fighting, lawyer in the afternoon, sign the papers in the evening, you know, and it's just like, wow, we just got divorced in 24 hours. Went from being happily married to divorced. No, what it is, is it's a buildup of, of bitterness. And the Bible talks a lot about bitterness, where you don't forgive and you, you have the same grievance that you're angry about and you're letting the sun go down on your wrath. Okay, that's where marriages are destroyed. And so we need to make sure that we don't have, uh, that we're not quick to anger and that when anger comes, we don't hold a grudge from day to day but that we let things go. Because then when our spouse sins against us, we can still have a fresh start tomorrow and not just have a negative slant on everything for the rest of our lives because of, you know, this fight that we had. You know, be positive and start over a fresh start in the next day. Uh, number six, don't make negative comparisons about your spouse in your mind. In other words, don't compare them negatively to other people. Like, oh, that husband is better than my husband in this way. Or he's better looking than my husband. Or he's better provider than my husband. Or she's better looking than my wife. Or she, you know, if you're, never let negative comparisons enter your mind about your spouse. Okay? Number seven, uh, don't, don't let your appearance and your hygiene go to pot if you want to have a good marriage. You know, if you want to have a happy marriage, don't just be one that just lets yourself become a slob that doesn't take care of the way that you look. You don't take care of your body. You don't take care of your hygiene. And, uh, that, you know, you're just making yourself as unappealing as possible to your spouse. Well, you know what? That's bad for your marriage. Uh, and then uh, lastly, this in Luke chapter 6. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse 32, For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them to whom ye hope to receive, of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. What we see here is that we should, a couple things. Number one, we should not wait for our spouse to be the person that they're supposed to be before we start being the person that we're supposed to be. He says, don't just love those who love you. Don't have this attitude that says, well, I'm going to start loving my wife when she starts reverencing me. 
When she shows me some love, then I'll show her love. Or as a wife to say, well, I'll reverence my husband, but he needs to be more loving first. No, the Bible says that we as Christians should be the one to make the first move and that we should do right by our spouse, love them and, and, and obey the Lord and, and do right by them whether they are a bad spouse or not. So don't blame everything on your spouse and say, well, I would be a great wife if I were married to somebody else. Or I'd be a great husband if I were married to a woman like so-and-so. I'd be the best husband ever. I'd be the best wife ever. You know what? That's a lie. Because God expects us to do it in whatever situation we're in. To be the best. So I don't care how much of a loser you think your husband is. You need to just be the best wife that you can. And no matter how bad of a wife you think you have, you need to be the best husband you can. And you know, you may find that by doing your part, they'll do their part more too. And you say, well, what if they don't? Well, you know what? God's still going to bless you and you're going to be right with the Lord because at least you did what you were supposed to do. And that's what Christ is calling us to do. Not to just love those that love us. Not to just do good unto those that do good unto us. But to be the one who loves even our enemies. Now, I'm not saying your wife is your enemy or your husband's your enemy. But if they are at enmity with you, you still should love them and do right by them. And not have this attitude of, you know... Well, you know, I'll do this if you do this. And because I did this, now you're going to do this. You know, when you do something for your spouse, when you give unto your spouse, it shouldn't be just to get something in return. When you give something to your spouse or do something to your spouse, it, it, some, something for your spouse, you should do it out of the goodness of your heart with no strings attached. And a lot of bitterness in marriage comes from people, they do something for their spouse, and it's like, now I want something in return. It's like, well, wait a minute, that's not how it works. You know, you show your love and you do things for your spouse, hoping for nothing again. Not, uh, not expecting it to be requited, but rather just because it's out of the goodness of your heart. Okay. Now, again, obviously there's an authority structure there and there, obviously there are expectations that the husband has for his wife and so forth. But that's another story. I'm just talking about when it comes to acts of kindness and when it talks about just, you know, being loving and, and doing the right things. You know, we can't wait for our spouse to do right by us, and then all of a sudden we're going to start obeying the Bible. We need to be the one to take the first step. And you need to take this, this sermon and not try to apply it unto your spouse and go home and say, did you hear him? Did you hear what he said? He said, you're supposed to make me the food I like, you know, and you're, and you're supposed to be, you know, doing this and that. And, you, you know, and then it's like, well, yeah. You, let's throw your video game console in the trash because he talked about that too. You know, look, honestly, just apply this to your, don't go home, you know, you've already failed if your attitude is just blaming the other person and you're, you know, it's all their fault and, and if, they, if they could only get this, this message and apply it. But you know, if only you could get this message and apply it, you know, you need to be the one to take that first step. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much uh, for our wives and our husbands, Lord, respectively. And, and thank you for uh, the teachings of your word, Lord, to help us to stay married because everyone around us is, is failing and divorcing and, and, and not staying married, Lord. Thank you for giving us your word to give us some guidance how we can succeed, Lord, and how we can actually have a, a successful marriage that, that would honor you. And, and not to just succeed by staying married, but actually to be happy and to get along with each other and, and enjoy each other's company, Lord. But help us to, to be willing to take some steps and make some changes in our lives. And, you know, a lot of the things that I said tonight might not apply to a lot of people, but, Lord, I pray that there would just be at least one thing that, that each uh, married couple heard tonight that would help them, just at least one thing that they'd say, you know what, that's something that I think I could do better, and I think I could have a better marriage if I would put that into practice. And so, Lord, I just pray that every single person would walk away with one truth tonight uh, that would help them to have a happy, successful marriage for the sake of their kids, for the sake of our church, for the sake of Christ, and for the sake of our nation. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.